Welcome back to the Korean Hour Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry. And of course, as listeners, you'll know throughout the summer, we've been running a literature series of the podcast focused entirely on Korean literature, and of course, a diversion from normal programming. And this is going to be the last episode of that. And appropriately, this series is going to end in the same way that it began, with an interview with Min Soo Kang. Now, Min Soo is an associate professor of history at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. And we did a podcast together, the first one of this series, at the start of the summer. That podcast focused on the story of Hong Gil Dong, the famous Joseon Dynasty-era tale that most Koreans already know down to their bones, but of course was something very different to what they imagined it was going to be. And what they imagine is there in the text, this disconnect between history and reality, and how cultural norms build up over time and change the meaning of what texts originally were. And in a similar vein, we're going to look at a different story today. This again is from the Joseon Dynasty, and again is a deep look not just into literature, but into that era itself, the values, the people, the culture, the fears and the ambitions that they had. And this is going to be done through Min Su's translation and analysis of the record of the virtue of Queen In Hyung, Lady Min. And again, just like with Hong Gil Dong before, this is a tale that many people inside Korea think they already know down to their bones. They have some understanding of what it is. It has built up over time and become a cultural icon, and something with a number of modern day adaptions. In movie and TV, all the while the story changing and twisting. And this is why Min Su is so important here. He looks into the background of these texts not just as a literary scholar, but with that well-trained historical eye. He pulls apart the origins of the story, who likely wrote it, why it was written, why certain themes emerge and others don't. And as you will see throughout this podcast, once you've seen Min Su do this, once you've had this lens applied to the text, it is very hard to understand it in any other way. And suddenly, a lot of the details that are represented in the text suddenly make a lot more sense, even the ones that are noticeable through their absence. This is a story of palace intrigue of love and marriage, of royal ascension and noble birth, of virtue and the lack of virtue, of infighting, deceit, backstabbing, marriage and conflict, and ultimately retribution, change, and moral rectitude. This is a story deeply analogous, at least in the core details, to Henry VIII, his divorce from Catherine of Aragon in favour of Anne Boleyn, and then with the drama and the divorce and the changes that happen thereafter. It is all deeply Machiavellian, always interesting, and I cannot think of a better way to end this series. If you haven't read Min Su's work or listened to him speak before, you're in for a treat. On every level, this is fun and deeply impressive. And of course, below the podcast, I'm going to link the two texts that we speak about today, but I'm also going to link below the first interview that I conducted with Min Su Kang on Hong Gil Dong for anyone that is interested in the background story of that particular podcast, that particular interview, and the similarities and differences that will occur between those two texts and how they do and do not interplay with each other. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. We have made a conscious decision here in the podcast not to run advertising in any way. This, of course, means, however, that we entirely depend on you, the listener. So if you like the podcast, if you listen to it and you want it to continue, it is important that you do your best to go to the links below and support us at either the Patreon or PayPal accounts as best you can. If not, it is also incredibly valuable and incredibly helpful if you can share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. All the help in this regard is greatly appreciated. On that, and to walk us through the record of the virtue of Queen Ni Hong, Lady Min, this is Min Su Kang. Min Su Kang, welcome back to the Korean Art Podcast. Thanks for having me again. So you were the first guest in our literature series, and back then we spoke about uh, Hong Gil Dong and your analysis and translation of that particular text. And you're going to be the last guest as well, which is fitting, because I had a huge amount of popular feedback from that first podcast. So today we're going to speak about a different a different translation and a different analysis that you've done. And this one is the record of the virtue of Queen In Hyong, Lady Min. So as we get started, uh, just give us a very brief overview of what this text is, just so people listening will know where we're heading here. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, this... Uh story that I translated, in terms of its literary structure um, and its contents and style, is yet another one of these um, popular fictions that were written, um, probably originally in Hangul, either in the late 18th century or the the 19th century. Um, Now, uh, it is based on a very famous incident that every Korean knows about that occurred in the Korean royal court in the very late uh, 17th century, um, starting from the 1680s onwards. And it had to do with um, 
the fact that the king at that time, King Sukjong, uh, married um, a, a woman who was who was whose posthum, posthumous name is going to be Inhyun, um, who is going to incur the reputation of being the perfectly uh, ideal virtuous woman, according to sort of the Confucian patriarchal notions uh, at the time. Um, but um, because she failed to produce an heir, the king chose a concubine by the name of Chang, and she receives the honor honor name of He, which means um, which means a uh, uh, fortune. So she becomes commonly known as Chang Hui Bin, uh, meaning the cons uh, the the concubine the royal concubine Chang with the name of He. And she, in the stories and with the reputation that she develops, becomes the very opposite of Queen Inhyun, um, the sort of the nightmare of the femme fatale, <laughs> um, greedy, ambitious, um, and uh, um, vain and venal and all that. And she engineers the downfall of the queen because she wants to be queen um, by slandering her and the uh, King is convinced of it and actually ousts um, his uh, the good queen Inhyun, and she has to suffer in exile for a number of years. But at some point, the king realizes the falsity of the slanders that had been put forward, and therefore reinstates the queen and demotes Chang Hui Bin, the uh, the concubine Chang Hui, back to her uh, lower status. At which point in the story that I translated, um, um, asks uh, shamans and fortune tellers to perform these curses upon the queen who falls under this mysterious illness and eventually dies. And uh, later on, the king discovers the use of the magic and uh, uh, and has uh, the concert, uh, the, the concubine Chang Hui executed. Right? Um, so, um, so it's um, so. Uh, the virtuous Queen Inhyun is the central character, and uh, um, and the main drama is is um, generated through the contrast between the ideal queen and the um, the, the vilified um, uh, uh, concubine. Um, but um, I mean, I'm sure you'll ask about this, so I won't, I won't talk about too much about this, but. Um, but uh, it is really, really, really important for the listeners, anybody who <laughs> wants to do, uh, engage with the story, that history is one thing, and a novel based on that <laughs> history is co- something completely different. And, uh, um, and as I pointed out in my introduction to this translation that was, uh, that was published in the journal Azalea, um, I, uh, it, it, um, it's very disheartening to me, especially as a historian, when people describe this novel as some kind of a biography, some kind of a historical document. It isn't. Um, and uh, it's, it was, it's disheartening to me when um, I, I, I've read uh, even academic works in both English and Korean where they freely um, use passages from the novel in order to discuss the actual events that occurred. There's a great distance between the two between the two, as I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it would be bad if um, I was writing, say, a historical piece. It, it would be as bad if I was writing a historical piece about, say, King Henry VIII. And I quote um, from Hilary Mantel's novels, <laughs> recent best-selling novels uh, about that period, without even, you know, uh, properly telling the readers that I'm quoting from a modern novel rather than from you know documents from uh, the, the the time period of Henry VIII. But in with this, uh, I've seen it done quite a lot of times. So that's uh, I'm sure that um, that you know we'll discuss that. But um, I I, th- I think thematically one of the most important things to um, to uh, notice and why. I felt that this was really important for me to translate it, is the entire problematic nature about how not just, you know, pre-modern Korea, but all patriarchal societies tend to pigeonhole women into 
these binaries of the idealized virtuous woman and this vilified, um, uh, you know, un, uh, w- a woman of low qualities. Uh, it's uh, it's sometimes referred to as the uh, in the West as the Madonna ma- uh, Madonna whore complex. Um, and uh, um, in the case of Korea, if you just replace that and say Queen Inhyun, uh, <laughs> concubine Chang Hee, that makes perfect sense to all Koreans. <laughs> And there would be uh, almost an exact analogy of the two. And yes, we're going to dig into all those historical details, as well as that uh, really interesting look at the position of those two women there. But before we do launch into it, uh, you begin your introduction here and you say that uh, the virtue of this uh, this story, the record of the virtue of Queen In, In- Hyong, it's a cluster of closely related texts, and just as with Hong Gildong, there's a whole number of texts out there to be found on the subject based on the popularity of the story. So I might get to start with a question about the particular translation you chose and why you chose this one. Yes, um, so um, as with the Hong Gildong texts, um, the ones that tend to be the longest are the ones that tend to be the earliest um, because of the way in which the market system for popular fiction worked in the late 18th and uh, 19th century, which was that a uh, they would put out a text, and if it proved to be popular, both hand copiers and printers would start publishing shortened versions of it um, so that they can actually save money on the paper. Um, and, uh, and so... Um, so once you have a really popular work like the story of Hong Gil-tung or the story of Queen Inhyun, um, the longer its popularity lasts, the shorter the texts tend to become. So you want to pick the ones that are longest um, because that is uh, that you know that that is likely to be the earliest. And I actually picked the one that was second to the longest one uh, for a for one very specific reason. Um, the only reason that this other this one other text that I rejected is longer is because there's a much longer description of um, the sufferings of not Queen Inhyun, but the high official um, Pak Tae Bo, who was the leading official who led the protest to, to the king against the ousting of the innocent Queen Inhyun. And he, and this is much longer description of, I mean, much longer uh, excruciating descriptions of his torture and um, and his, you know, and the way he was killed and and its consequence on on his family and so on. Um, well, the, 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 well, there's a couple of reasons. One, um, literary wise, it's it's the the longer parts are not very good. <laughs> you know, because I, I, I'm sure you felt that even in this text, I mean, the descriptions of his sufferings were pretty damn long, right? Yes, and, yes. And, uh, um, and after a while, you just become kind of inured to it, right? It's like, okay, yeah, now they're doing this to him. Now they're doing that to him. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, and also, the uh, um, you know, upon uh, consultation with um, uh, other professors uh, who work on this, um, what... Uh, that addition seemed to me is that um, I mean I, you know I mean this 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 is this is a this is a mere theory um, and you know I'm, I'm, it's important to really emphasize that because we don't we don't have any definitive uh, evidence for this but it's it's a it's a theory that makes sense um, so um, in Korean noble families um, with long uh, long illustrious lineages who boast of very illustrious figures among their ancestors. Um, what they used to do is that um, occasionally, um, either a member of the family or, or, or somebody that they hired would write a uh, idealized biographies of the members of their family, and s- uh, not not for publication, but for internal reading within the within the clan. Um, so they could read uh, about their illustrious ancestors and feel proud that they belong to this illustrious clan and all that, um, including uh, and and one of the one of the um, you know uh, virtues that would often show up are people uh, 
who sacrifice themselves for ideal purposes, um, who knowing the terrible consequences that may that they may incur as a result of, say, protest against the king for what they felt was a wrongful, you know, action, that they went and added anyway, and then they were executed or exiled and so on, right? Um, now, um, what um, scholars tell me is that um, the section both where you go, you know, uh, where you where it goes on and on and on praising the virtues and the sufferings of Queen Inhyun, as well as the virtues and the sufferings of the official Pak Te Bo. And, you know, and in, in my introduction, I point out, like, if if this story is analogous to the story of King Henry VIII's first divorce from Catherine of Aragon and, you know, his his, his love of Queen, uh, uh, of uh, his, his second Queen um, Anne Boleyn, um, Pak Te Bo is the Thomas More of the situation. <laughs> I mean, he's the he's the he's the high ranking, you know, uh, um, uh, a, a man of noble ideals who, you know, who refused to go along with this and protest until for, and until he is uh, executed. Um, anyway, I mean, so um, that those parts um, have they they read like these uh, idealized biographies. And so while this cannot be um, definitively proven, but one of the sources may be, or, or of these writings may be from these clan uh, you know, biographies, uh, from the Min clan that, that produced Queen Inhyun, and from the illustrious Park clan that produced uh, official Park Devo, right? Um, and, uh, um, and so, um, and, and you know, and, and again, I mean, because these are, <laughs> I mean, you know, remember, these aren't objective biographies, <laughs> right? These are biographies written to venerate um, your ancestors. So they're not going to, I mean, so they're not going to be like, like going to be well-rounded, you know, objective accounts, right? <laughs> um, and so, um, so after reading, you know, the, the longest version, I felt, I felt that just, um, although that may be an older one, I mean, although I, I can't be sure of that as well, because, you know, as I said, saying that, I mean, I, as I said, you know, when a text is longer, it tends to be the case that that's the uh, oldest one, but not necessarily so. But in general, that's a good guide when you're trying to determine which text is older or younger. Um, at the end of the day, I felt that um, the second shorter version with less detailed description of the sufferings of uh, official Pak Te Bo was just, uh, on a purely literal level, a uh, superior text. Um, and I just felt that my uh, readers of my translation just don't need that extra stuff about <laughs> being tortured and killed and so on, right? Because it's enough of that in this text, right? I mean, it's not yes. like you don't have it here, right? Um, so, so that, uh, so that's, um, so that's the, um, that, the, so that's what went into my mind when when deciding on the on, on this particular one. And when we talk about the this uh, this. This odd line that, as you mentioned, many people try to walk between claiming that this is historical when there's so many elements of it that are hard to look at in in a, a real historical light. Uh, mm -hmm. You write here that uh, it's, it's also likely that it wasn't even written at the time. So you write a, a lot of modern scholars have said that this is perhaps were written by someone who witnessed the events in the royal court themselves. But as you write here, the, uh, there's 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 no evidence for this, and more importantly. There is evidence in the writing of um, it has characteristics of Hangul, and the dissemination mm -hmm. of Hangul would have happened later. So it's more likely to have to be a text that was written some centuries later. Absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, um, the events described uh, the, the sort of triangular relationship between uh, 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 triangular relationship among Queen Inhyun, King Sukjong, and uh, um, and uh, and and concubine Zhang He. Uh, that pretty much, I mean, that that occurs in the starting from the 1680s and ends in the first decade of the 18th century. Um, I, I think Queen Inyan dies in 1701, uh, and uh, um, and uh, and concubine Changhui is is executed not long after that. Um, but so so here's the thing, I. Um, but the text that I translated, ha as, uh, as you pointed out, has the characteristics of a war of the kind of works that start to get uh, written a full century later. Um, so, um, 
so I think the full text we have, but um, what I am willing to concede, and this is well within the realm of possibility, that some of the texts that the author used to consult may have been earlier. Um, mm. Precisely these internal clan biographies that may have been writ written much earlier. Um, that you know that that somehow got floated around, and when you know, say you got this popular writer of the. Uh, I, I mean, when I say popular, I don't mean um, somebody who's himself popular, but who writes popular fiction uh, for the common people. When he sets out to write a novel about Queen Inhyeon, he would have had to like consult certain texts, and he may have gotten a hold of a text that is from an earlier period, including this idealized biographies um, of the characters that came out of the households of the Min family and the Bak family. Um, but um, if you look at the work overall as it stands, um, yeah, I mean, the, the likelihood that this was written by somebody who was actually there in the late, uh, you know, 17th century or full century before these, these kind of works uh, began to produce is, um, is, is highly, highly unlikely. And why do you think it is the case that people are uh, still attributing uh, historical uh, significance to this? Because importantly, again, and as you write, there is mentions of ghosts and goblins and demons and, and all these things that um, and of wild dogs scared in the way. There's a lot of real things in there that you that a modern scholar will have to look back on and say this is clear myth that is being built up here. So why is it that people are seeming to miss this this uh, element of the story? Yeah. Um, okay. I think there's a number of reasons for it, and uh, um, and and couple of it is just kind of like standard. Um, one, I I just don't think many people read this. Actually. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, I mean, just as with like uh, the story of Hong Gil-dong, so famous, everybody in Korea knows the story of Hong Gil-dong, except only a tiny like you know <laughs> group have actually read the work from you know from beginning to end, and. And you know, and much of it is much of it is because um, Koreans think they know this story. I mean, they they I mean, it's they know their story because they're so familiar with it. And um, I mean, they, there's going to be very. I mean, if you if you go around like and just grab random people in the streets of Korea and say, you know, do you know the story of Queen Inhyun and um, and you know concubine Zhang He? Everybody will tell, you know, oh, this happened and that happened. I mean, I mean, they, they all know the basic story. And then if you ask the question, like, have you read it? <laughs> <They'll> say, <laughs> no. And but I don't need to read it because I, you know, th th there's been I mean, I, they've been so many television productions of this story and movies and, you know, uh, and novels written about it and so on. I mean, it's it's a story that just floats in the air like of Korea. Um you know, and it's somewhat like the somewhat like the story of Hong uh, Hong Gutong, but um, you know, but uh, as I mentioned in the book, um, this, I mean, this wasn't the last major TV production, but I, I I saw most of a production that was made in two thousand and two, and they told the story, and I in a hundred episodes, <laughs> in one hundred episodes, right, and uh, and um, and and it was a, it was a popular show. I mean, I mean, one of the reasons why it was popular is one of the leading Korean actresses of that time, Kim Hesu, she played. Uh, I mean, she played not the queen, but she played you know the the, the concubine Zhang He, who for various reasons I'm sure we'll talk about is has emerged as a as a much more famous uh, and uh, complicated and interesting literary figure than uh, Queen Inyon, which is what the, the original text uh, that I translated was really about. You know, I mean, it was about her, it was about the queen, mm. but for various reasons, it's it's the villain who emerges as a much more iconic figure in the Korean imagination. Um, so uh, so I, I think for the general public, I mean, the fact that they actually haven't read the uh, novel and saw how it's how filled with supernatural elements it is um, and how it just fits into that kind of three structured uh, form of classical novels. Um, and also just the fact that they're so familiar with the story from TV productions uh, and um, uh, that that um, that makes them, you know, that, that makes them think that when you say, you know, the Joseon dynasty writing Queen Inhyeon, 
they they just fall into this impression that um it's it's like a historical document as a as you know kind of a you know um historical biography as opposed to what it really is 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 a is a pure work of fiction with lots of you know uh imaginative element of it um now the thing is i i i think most like i most um uh, I could, you know, I mean, real academics who deal with Korean literature know this, uh, and Korean history know this. But, um, but the fact that they, I mean, I, I've ran across works that still use um, the novel and the historical re- records side by side without distinguishing it um, is is problematic. And also, I think you know that you know because I, I still think. Um, I mean, I mean, the proper story about you know uh, the the proper history of the entire uh, entire tradition of Korean popular fiction that that hasn't actually seeped out yet. Um, that I think many people might, I mean, e- even scholars, even academics might think that um, since there has been theory going on that this work. Uh, was written by somebody who may have witnessed the events, um, in, and one of the one of the theories that has been put forward that it's it may be one of those palace maidens who you know um, who were there. Um, that we can use it almost as a contemporary source, um, but I mean, but all you have to do is consider the work as a whole to see why that's that's hugely problematic. Um, and and but also for me, it's uh, it's also like. Um, you know, even if even if you even if you think that uh, there's value in using a literary work like this in order to explicate the history, one of for me one of the major important things is 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 what's missing. What's you know what what the story doesn't tell about what really went on in those uh, you know in, in those events. And uh, mm-hmm. and again, I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it. But what, one of it which has to do with uh, court, uh, you know, intrigues that has uh, that has everything to do with factional conflicts and uh, um, in which you know and people like Quinn Inhyun and uh, um, concubine Chang here were basically just pawns in this very complicated political game and yes when when you do when I did read through your analysis and then read through the story itself that particular part of the palace entry the infighting it once you read it through that light it explains a lot of what's in the narrative itself but Let's jump into that crossplay between those two central characters. And as you mentioned at the start, a lot of this is about the virtue of one woman and the uh, and the lack of virtue of the other. So characteristics like she's wise and learned and she has vanity. Uh, she has doesn't have vanity. She has no ambition, no greed. This kind of thing. And and uh, this is crossplayed to uh, the um, concubine Jiang, who is uh, uh, mendacious and vain and jealous and all these things. But in really importantly, it seems in all of this is the status of birth, as in these things are not learned, they are born into in some way. It really focuses on where they're born. And for anyone doubting this, the very first sentence smashes you over the head like a sledgehammer here. It says, Queen Inhorn made Lady Min, the second wife of King Suk Jung of the Great of Joseon, came from a noble lineage. It starts straight up like that. It's trying to really burrow into the reader that uh, where you're born really matters here. Absolutely, um, and also the obverse, which is the uh, uh, the common stock uh, that which um, concubine Zhang comes from, right? Um, mm. And uh, uh, and also that that's an interesting thing because um, th- there's some question about um, uh, concubine Zhang's background that um, it um, it appears. I mean, I, I I've seen pretty good evidence that suggests that she may not actually have come from the commoner class. Um, she may have, she, um, she, uh, but, but not from the Yangban nobility. But, um, but there, there, was a, there was a class in between the Yangban and commonality uh, and, 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 the, and the commoners. Um, and uh, it's, uh, um, and it's, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, there's, there's no one name for it. Um, although, like, a lot of people mistake it and, and use the term Jungin. Which means middle people, because and people think that that means uh, you know people who are in between the aristocracy and the and and, and the commoners. Uh, but Chunyin only refers to 
uh, families of um, who uh, families um, of uh, non-aristocratic officials. These were sort of like your uh, low to medium level bureaucrats who, or, or those who held positions in the um, in the royal court that were seen as, um, I mean, specialized tasks that are important, but seen as a little bit too lowly for young but nobility. Uh, and this would include court geomancers, um, doctors, and translators, and so on. Uh, but, uh, you know, and beca because these are skills that require education. Uh, these were not, I mean, this was beyond the capacity of most commoners. Um, and, uh, um, you know, there's uh, one, one uh, historian, Kyung Moon Hwang, um, he, he uses um, the term uh, the sec uh, secondary status people. And, uh, and and the thing is, the, the easiest way to describe it is that these are non-aristocratic elites, right? So they're not elites in the sense that they're not part of the Yangban nobility, but they uh, but they are above the status of regular commoners uh, because of certain privileges that they have, right? I mean, they include Jung Yin, who, you know, uh, who works uh, in, in, in government without, you know, holding high positions. And they also include uh, local elites, provincial elites, and so on, right? Um, and uh, um, now, I, um, th there's good evidence to suggest that um, concubine Chang comes from the secondary status people. So she wasn't from lowly background. But um, in this text and in others, there's an intimation that she, may ha she did come from a lowly background. And uh, and I think that goes right into what you were saying, right? mm -hmm. that these, you know, they, they, these qualities of characters come from, you know, the class that you you, you come out of. Right. That sort of, um, you know, I, that that concubine Chang, uh, even when she does become first the concubine and the, and the queen and so on, I I mean, she can't shake off you know, uh, her lower qualities that comes from the fact that, you know, she's from the lower class. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, I, the, the class prejudice is, you know, definitely there. And of course, that would probably explain why it's so important for these people to write uh, these biographies, looking back and placing themselves in those elite circles. But uh, as, as, as we jump into the story, before we get into some of those really interesting details about the infight, and let's get into some of the details of the story itself. And uh, one of the virtues of uh, Queen Min and her family as well is this uh, humility of sorts and this plays out really strongly throughout the story so a lot of things happen in the story but two themes seem to run up again and again there's an awful lot of letter writing everyone is writing letters to each other there's not a lot of personal interaction uh, that happens in the story a lot of it happens through letter and always when these letters arrive with offers um, they are refused and then refused and then refused and then accepted and that seems to be an important part of the virtue of this, that you have to, uh, almost like a social convention, you must say no, no, no. So when Queen Ming's uh, father is first asked for a hand in marriage, he says no, and then eventually eventually he says yes. And then when Queen Ming is, is uh, exiled and the king wants her back, she goes through an elaborate uh, scheme of saying no, 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 and eventually she succumbs when you know she's going to anyway. So I wonder how you look at that particular type of interaction within the story. Yeah, um, so that's a great one because it's, uh, I mean, it's, 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 um, it's both historically accurate, right? Because, I mean, when you're granted certain honors, uh, you feel duty bound to say, oh, I don't deserve this, you know, please, you know, come on. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and then, you know, and that, that forces the person who's trying to do you a favor to just, you know, say, oh, no, you do deserve this and so on. And, uh, and so it's it's to a certain extent it's self-serving, but at the same time, you know, uh, you you're supposed to be modest. You're supposed to say these things, but um, I, you know, um, I'm kind of reluctant to say this, but I, I'll <laughs> say it anyway. I because I don't I don't really have any evidence, uh, any really evidence to this. So, um, you know, the queen, um, I mean, she's supposed to be so virtuous because she doesn't hold a grudge. Um, and uh, she just accepts whatever position that comes to her, and she never loses her loyalty to the king and all that. So, so when the king wants to reinstate her um, and uh, is trying to summon her, she repeatedly says no. I mean, it just goes on and on. Mm, <laughs> well, yes. so come on, right? And uh, <laughs> and um, and the way she 
puts, you know, the reasons behind why she's doing that. He said, I, I, you know, I'm a condemned woman. How dare I even consider going back to the, you know, palace and, and all that, right? And, uh, and, you know, so, <laughs> and I was... You know, I had this, this, this is what I'm reluctant to talk about. I had this distinct sense that he, she's kind of punishing the king. Right? Yes, it did feel like that, yes. Yeah, and I may be completely wrong about that. I mean, I mean, I may be in the context of Joseon Dynasty. That that That's a really modern reading, right? And, uh, uh, you know, and I it, it, may, it may be too modern of me to think that she, in the you know, back of the mind said, I'm not going to come back, <laughs> You want to, like, after what you did to me? No, you're gonna beg. You're gonna want me. You're gonna you're gonna beg me and beg me and beg me, and then I'm finally I'm gonna say yes. And he right? does uh, beg and beg and beg. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so I, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know enough about the sort of the sort of the cultural uh, mentality of this period to think that that's what you're. I mean, that that's what the author intended the readers to get. Um. Or it, it may very well be the case is that that um, in you know in the Joseon dynasty mentality you are supposed to say oh she's so virtuous I mean she is indeed really virtuous that she she thinks herself so lowly that she she just uh, really feels uncomfortable you know regaining her position as queen and all that right um, so I don't know but um, but you know but I but as you said you know either way. Um, I, I mean, you're perfectly right because these these are ritual. These are rituals. Mm. <laughs> these are established rituals um, that you you know that you're supposed to um, you know enact. Um, which is you know um, again, I, I the point that you also made, I, I agree with completely. It it is sort of like even in modern times when somebody's you know trying to do your fa- you know fable, give you a gift and all that. You you're supposed to refuse at first, right? And uh, and so on. Um, and uh, um, so, so, yeah, so that part, I think, um, I mean, here, here's the thing. I, I think for a lot of modern readers, it it just may just get really annoying. Right? Yes. <laughs> and just say yes already, you know, come on, right? <laughs> but um, but I, I think what, what, I mean, what I would tell my students who are reading this and have felt that way is that, yes, it is for us. But, um, you know, that's the kind of thing you should ask the historical question of, well, why are these people doing this? And understand this as part of this sort of this performance. I mean, that that's what it is. It's a performance of virtue, performance of um, you know uh, propriety to go back and forth and do this. And in fact, um, you know, I mean, people at the time. And, and, and the thing is, I mean, even in certain cultures, um, people would find you rude and um, and overly. Um, enthusiastic when you don't do it (laughs) yes um and uh and so so i I would say that you know i I would tell my students that rather than just you know just being annoyed at it just think about why these people are doing and and appreciate the fact that you are being you are learning something about the performative act of communication especially at the highest level among you know among people who are dealing with issues of the positions of power so in this, how should we look at the king? Because as you mentioned there, he, um, uh, of course, he uh, dismisses his wife and then he begs for her back. And as you, you mentioned, those five years or six years in the middle when she's in exile, they're excused away very quickly. Even the queen, uh, as you mentioned there as well, says, uh, I'm a condemned person. She, she doesn't openly say anything hostile to the king. And he is excused as being deceived by his consort who becomes queen but uh, uh and in the translation in a quote here it says uh, this is about the consort she says she was a cunning and deceitful person who knew how to please the king so she became loved by him so it, it, it's hard to properly place the character of, of the king in this if she's such a deceitful person of such lower class and um and such poor moral standard why couldn't the king see uh, through it why was he, was he deceived so thoroughly and uh, why is he excused so easily by everyone around him who simply passes off as saying he had a five-year lapse in character almost mm-hmm. yes um yeah i i think there's numbers of really good points uh there including the fact that um i mean i think for chosen dynasty writers it 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 would have been extraordinarily difficult to write something in which 
a king is described in that faultier manner. Uh, um, mm. And you know, I, um, I you know, un unless we're talking about an ousted king, I mean, but there's there's only only two kings in the in the entire uh, Joseon dynasty who who've been actually you know ousted through a coup d'état. Um, Yeon Sang-gun and you know Kwang Yi-gun, who um, I mean, who's 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 known even today by their princely names because they they you know they never got their um, posthumous temple names. Um, and there there was numbers of other kings during the Joseon dynasty who were who were ousted, uh, but at the end for their own survival, they cooperated with the people who were ousting them to make it look like a voluntary abdication. And mm. that way, they were honored, and uh, they were honored with posthumous temple names after their deaths, right? Um, but uh, so, so Yeon Sang Gun and Kwang Gun are the only two monarchs who did not cooperate, and as a result, um, people are free to criticize them if, if you know after their fall. But uh, with especially, especially with King Suk Jung, who who generally had a uh, had, had a very uh, very good posthumous uh, you know reputation. And uh, uh, and also as for me as well as a historian, uh, when I look back at you know the the real King Suk Jong, I I'm actually really increasingly uh, impressed with him. And I'll you know I'll talk I'll maybe talk about that later. But um, mm. so in the story, I mean, it's first um, in terms of the the culture. I mean, I I it, it would be very very hard to overtly criticize a king, even when he commits a serious wrong. That has to be explained away. Now I think for. Um, may I mean I, I, this may be the case not just for as a modern reader, but um, but you still are supposed to I think get the point that he did wrong that he may he's 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 not a flawless king because um, so so you get this contradiction between like a lot of praise of this king about how wise he was and how judicious he was and all that and. You know, and next to that, it's him being so wrong and just being completely taken in by the slanders of his concubine against, um, you know, uh, his uh, perfect wife. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think that may be a real, that may be a real, um, not, not just a modern imposition of our views, but there may be a real dissonance in the text that I wouldn't be surprised if the author meant us to have. And he's in a position where he can't outright criticize a king, uh, you know, especially one with such a, you know, generally positive, um, you know, posthumous reputation. But at the same time, he has to sort of account for, you know, why he was wrong, and wrong in this case. So you pile up the blame on the concert, uh, on the concubine Chang, um, and uh, to make it all her fault. But I, 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 I agree with you, but I think at the end of the day, you still are left with this feeling that, man, he wasn't that wise. You know? <laughs> he was, uh, and uh, um, and I, I actually wouldn't be surprised if, if there was the author's intent, right? Um, so criticizing the king without criticizing him. You know, criticizing him while overtly putting all the blame on somebody else. Um, and... Uh, um, so I yeah I I think that's a really interesting point and I I, I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know the text is rather interesting. I mean it's I mean you know in in many ways you could you could sort of I mean on on a purely literary basis you could, uh, sort of criticize the, a novel for being um, I mean it's, you know and, and indulging in too many cliches where. You know, all the characters are either really, really, really good or really, really, really bad. Um, but I, I think there, there are elements in this where of, of uncertainty that I find interesting. It's including what we are supposed to think about the king. Um, because after all, I mean, he's the one in charge. I mean, he, after without him actually doing this, um, none of the action could have taken place, right? I mean, he's, he's the one who ousts the queen and then... He's the one who reinstates her, and so on, right? So, um, so yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't think the reader can help putting the blame on the king, even when the text refuses to do it overtly. And when the king is not being the moral character, it is the court around him. And this is a good way to lead us into that question you mentioned earlier about the factionalism and the historical context, which is left out in the text but really explains a lot about it and begins to give a good light on this 
idea that it may be a young man biography, a type of uh, pro posthumous propaganda for us to wait to see these noble families. So when the king dismisses his wife, uh, a lot of the ministers around him are upset and they protest and they're all exiled or demoted. And this is where Baek Tebo comes in. He protests and protests and protests to the point where the king effectively tortures him to death. And uh, this is, is really hard to see in any other light than perhaps it might be that that historical context, that place where, um, uh, as you mentioned in your analysis here, of there's an, this infighting between these factions, the East and the West, and this uh, this moment, which is left out explicitly in the text itself. So I might get open us up there. What was this infight and that was happening around the court? And why might it help explain uh, a lot of the details that are happening inside the story itself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so anybody studying um, Chosen Dynasty politics at the highest level um, cannot avoid dealing with factions as a fact and as you know to a great extent that one of the most determining factors in the way policies are shaped uh in the way that kings are you know uh successful or unsuccessful and so on right um and um and factionalism was just i mean i mean the role it played both negative uh and positive um is it cannot be separated from you know proper understanding of chosen dynasty politics right and of course it's all missing in this story the story doesn't you know it, it makes no references to these factions it just, it just talks about you know good officials and bad officials but without any you know without uh, talking about what's going on right um so um you know, so they, 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 I mean, whenever you have a kingdom of this sort, you're always going to have factions. I mean, you know, a group of allies and you know, who are either connected by friendship or family and who, you know, who form blocks depending on self-interest or ideology. Um, and uh, um, but in Joseon Dynasty, during the time of King Sanjo, uh, which was in, uh, which was the time during the uh, great Japanese invasion of Korea in the late uh, 16th century, they were formalized into uh, into uh, but into two groups, which uh, subdivided into groups. So, so what what you'll have is when one group uh, managed to become victorious over the other, instead of that group just remaining dominant, it'll tend to split, yes. right? Because you're going to have different leaders who want to be, you know, uh, the the top dog in that, you know, and so on, right? And so. So you get over time from Joseon Dynasty, starting from the 16th century, you get an increasingly complicated array of divisions and subdivisions and so on. And sometimes it's um, the most vicious fight that's going on is among officials who used to be in the same faction, but then that faction became successful and then it split and now they are, you know, they're, they're at each other's throats and so on, right? Um, now... This presents an acute, acute problem for a king. Uh, now, the, one of the uh, one of the things that, like, um, you know, people will take a not a holy but somewhat of a positive spin on the factional fight is is that um, that this was uh, one of the ways in which in Korea uh, in, in in Joseon Dynasty in particular um, a, a preventive measure against absolute monarchy of the king concentrating all of his power in himself right um because they would they would ha they, they they're forced to deal with factions they have to right um and they ha they have to balance that out and so on um now the thing is I, and so and so all uh, all the of most effective uh, chosen dynasty kings um you know uh, like king um uh king uh, sejong and king youngjo and so on um one of the reasons why they were so effective was that they were able to uh, they they were able to deal with the factions and control them in uh, you know in, um, in effectively right um, and the ones who are not able to uh, you know the ones who are regarded now as uh, ineffective kings are of two types the ones where they're not able to negotiate and deal with the factional conflicts and therefore. They ne they never get anything done because everything just comes into a gridlock, right? Um, and uh, uh, and the other type of king who are seen as unsuccessful are the ones who rely too much on one faction 
and and therefore the monarchy gets associated with that one faction, and that tends to unite the other factions against them, sometimes with terrible consequences. Um, and uh, uh, like for instance, you know, the ousted king, uh, uh, king, um, you know, uh, Kuang Yi Gun, um, he relied too much on one faction, the uh, the northern um, uh, the northern faction. Um, and as a result, he he uh, the other factions got together and they they initiated a coup d'état and put a relative in and uh, uh, and so on and so so his his uh, reign ended in disgrace like that. Um, now so so this was like a perennial problem for kings about how to deal with factions, right? How how best to deal with it and so on. Right? Um, and uh, um, now the thing is I. One of the reasons why I get really uh, impressed with King Suk Jung, who's who's sort of you know uh, who's portrayed as this flawed monarch in the novel, is that um, so so 18th century was like a really interesting time for Joseon Dynasty. Um, it's uh, uh, I mean I, I you know I, I really wish that people outside of you know uh, Korea and Korean studies would know more about it, study more about 18th century because it was a it's a really wonderful time um, and. Uh, there was peace and there was prosperity and there was lots of all kinds of innovation and learning, including in technology. Um, and one of you know the reasons for that, it had the really um, relatively long reigns of two of the best kings of Joseon Dynasty, uh, King Youngjo and King Jungjo, right? Um, and they are regarded as sort of the uh, you know really ideal monarchs who, who I mean, just real. And people who really ran the king like uh, professionals, and who were also very, very effective in keeping keeping the um, keeping the um, factions under control. Now, um, there's a policy that's associated, especially with King Youngjo, uh, a policy called um, Hwanguk, uh, which literally means a change of state or, um, or or flipping of the state or alteration of the state, right? Um, and uh, um, and and when it's associated with, with King Youngjo and and Jungjo, um, it it means something fairly innocuous. Um, and what it meant was the the uh, established policy of the monarch that whenever there's an important official position that becomes available, they will rotate among the different factions, right? So mm. that no one faction would become completely dominant. Right? So that would balance them all out to prevent any, you know, one faction from, you know, being so powerful that they could actually ch uh, challenge the king's policy. Now, that seems, I mean, that was widely praised as an effective and uh, um, and benevolent way of controlling the factions. And, they, you know, they, they were given due credit for it. Now, what what a lot of, his, uh, his, uh, you know, po more popular uh, historical um, texts uh, don't tell you was that, King Yongjo was not the one who started the Hwanguk uh, process. It was his father, King uh, Sukjong, who did it. Um, mm. And uh, and he he's the one who coined. Uh, it was under his reign that the t uh, term was coined. But um, originally, it meant something way more scary: <laughs> <laughs> uh, the change of state. Right? It it did not mean. Although you know he did some of it, it did not mean just rotation. A, a rotation in the interest of harmony among the factions. Right? Um, for him, um, you know, King Sukjong uh, becomes a, uh, you know, uh, uh, becomes a king, and you know he's thinking, okay, problem here. I mean, how do I deal with the factions, right? And uh, um, and so what he did was he enacted this policy um, of, of Wangguk, where what he would do is that among all these different factions that are exist in existence, he would really, really favor one, like a lot of previous you know, uh, incompetent kings did, right? In a dangerous way, right? Uh, and allow them to run roughshod among uh, other factions and, you know, just elevate them to the highest position and make them really, really powerful, right? Uh, which is what Kang Yi did with the uh, Northern faction. And then at a particular moment when that dominant faction is really pleased with themselves and they're complacent and they think that they have their king under their pocket, virtually overnight, just cut their head off, right? Uh, I mean, you know, accuse them of all kinds of crimes, you know, including corruption and, you know, uh, and uh, uh, even plotting, you know, against the king and so on, you know, arrest all the leaders, execute them, exile them, and just destroy them and destroy them with the help 
of all the other factions who've been feeling left out. Right? Yes. And uh, so, so you know, just over overnight, you just completely cut the head of one faction in favor of another, right? And uh, that 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 not, that the king is now using to you know kill the kill that faction and raise them up now to be the to be supreme, right? And you raise them and you raise them and then you do it again. <laughs> Now, during the time of Kickstarter, the two most powerful factions was the Western faction and the Southern faction. And he flip-flopped over them like three or four times. And uh, uh, and lots of people died. I mean, he, every time he flipped, and that flip is what at that time meant the you know change of state, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, change the regime. Uh, and so many people died. But at the end, he King Suchong got the result which he wanted, which was that he flip-flopped on them so much and killed so many of the leaders, at the end, there wasn't a single faction standing that was so powerful that they could challenge, uh, you know, central monarchy. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and because he weakened the faction in that way, he was able to lay the grand, uh, groundwork for his son, Yongjo, and, um, and his great-grandson, um, um, Chang, Changjo, to... Uh, to you know, maintain a strong centralized monarchy, um, and it, and then under King Yongjo, Hwangok became to mean something much more, you know, innocuous and nice, right? Just yeah. rotation as opposed to just killing, you know. Um, and uh, and so, um, if you look at the background uh, in the royal records of what was happening in the court when, in fact, you know, King uh, Sukjong married Queen Min um, and uh, and then ousted her. And uh, elevated, you know, concubine Zhang as his queen, and then then brought his queen back, and and eventually executed it. Um, it is not a coincidence that every single one of those episodes happen when he is changing the state, <laughs> right? So uh, queen queen uh, the queen Inhyun is associated with because her relatives are all in the Western faction. And concubine Zhang, um, although you know she's not from the nobility, she has all the supporters in the southern faction, right? So that um, as he, as the king is flipping them one after another and executing their leaders, that's when he gets rid of one, you know, one queen and gets another, and then gets rid of that one and brings another one back in, and so on. Um, look, I I don't want to exaggerate this too much. I think it would be too much of an exaggeration for me to assert too strongly that King Sukjong's personal feelings for these women had nothing to do with the real history, that they were all pawns in this very complicated and ingenious and really ruthless game that he was playing with this, uh, you know, um, playing uh, playing in his court. Um, I mean, I, 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 I probably don't think, I mean, because I, I, you know, just knowing human psychology, I don't think that makes it. But um, mm -hmm. I think whatever genuine feelings that the king may have had for both of his queens, um, as a hist I mean, if you're, if you're really interested in the history of this, the actual history of it, um, there was a distant secondary concern to the main game that's afoot, which is about yes. who has the power. Right? And so, um, so I mean, if you read a novel, it looks like it was all about passion, right? And it was all about deception. It was all about the quality of, of these two women and how the king felt about them, which is, I mean, I, I mean, it makes sense if you're a novelist, right? Because that makes mm -hmm. it for a much better story. Uh, but if you're a historian looking at the background to this, I, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, this is this is much more complicated story going here, and um, so I'll say this. I mean, I, 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 you know, I think the true story is that these women were much more pawns than than they were real objects of affection for the king, without actually definitively saying that. I, I don't think the feelings existed. I mean, look, I, I, you know, just going back to you know King Henry the Eighth, right? I mean, I, I don't. I don't doubt that he really, you know, uh, felt really deeply for Anne Boleyn, and uh, and you know, perhaps some or you know, some of the other, you know, of his queens as well. But um, I mean, look, when Anne Boleyn couldn't produce an heir, I mean, that was it for her. <laughs> I mean, it's like at the end, um, you know, I at the end, King Henry VIII wanted a son, and uh, um, 
and uh, you know, and again, I it would be too much for a historian to say that he didn't, you know, it was all about the politics and all about the succession. I'm sure there were genuine feelings involved, you know, uh, all the way around. But I, but you know, I mean, you know, I, Henry VIII was no fool. I mean, you know, <laughs> he, knew, he knew what was important. And from that infighting, it begins to put a different a different uh, lens on how. Uh, consort Jang is now being reinterpreted in the modern era, which you put these really important uh, looks at how uh, the story's been uh, now in the modern era brought into movies and TV, etc. And uh, you put a quote here from a, a very significant star of one of these shows, and she is t- writing about Consort Jang. And she writes, um, and she's speaking in an interview, sorry, and she says, She's a strong-willed person who is seeking to overcome the status prejudice of her society. And that's all about ambition. And yet in the text, she's criticized for her ambition all the time. And it's got a lot to do with how she's been reinterpreted today as almost like a, a feminist icon, someone who's standing up and trying to move forward. And I'm not sure how you read the text, but as I read the text, I became slightly sympathetic towards the character of Jang. There are some moments in there where you think, uh, this is strange, or she has real grievances here. There's a point when uh, the queen, who is not the queen anymore, this is Lady Min, who's been exiled, she comes back to the palace, and Consort Jang, who's now Queen Jang, laments. She says, I still occupy the seat of queen, so why does the deposed king queen not come and pay respects to me? Which seems like something quite reasonable. And then later she complains that when she's been redeposed, that she's not been allowed to choose the um, the wife of her son, that it is now Queen Min again who gets to do it. And some of these laments had me thinking at times, I can see where she's coming from a little bit here, and it might explain why she's being seen in a different light today. I'm not sure how you see it. Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, historically, I, I, you know, I sympathize with all these women, um, I, I sympathize with the queen. I sympathize with the concubine Chang. And um, I mean, because considering what a really, really strict patriarchal society Joseon Dynasty yeah. was, I mean, this is, um, I mean, all these women are in a terrible situation. I mean, I, I just, um, and I can't imagine what kind of a, I mean, how they went every day thinking about, oh my God, I have to survive. You know, I, I have to survive. And um, and in this kind of society that I live in, the only way I can survive is to continue to receive the favors of the most powerful people around me. And in the case of these queens, it's, of course, the king. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, um, I you know, his, as a historian and as, you know, as with my historical mentality, I, I just don't see these women in terms of good and evil and, you know, and virtuous and non-virtuous and so on. And uh and I so um, and I, I think that also leads to an important point. Um, so so I and it has to do with why I picked this work to translate. Mm. Um, you know, I the, the tr- uh, my decision to translate story of Hong Gil Dong. That's that's really obvious. I mean, that's that's really you know. I mean, that's a really famous uh, uh, story, and uh, it's a great adventure story. And you know, and Hong Gil Dong is a household name. Everybody loves it, and so on. But um, I, I had a whole other uh, reason for um, uh, picking this one, which is that um, I think for anybody interested in issues of women's history in the Joseon dynasty and after, even today, and, um, like, for instance, the legacy of the kind of um, treatment of women and views of women that Koreans are still living with today, um, and also uh, is, uh, issues of sort of ingrained views of uh, of women that is still present in Korean culture that I think um, even for feminists who are looking for ways in which to articulate resistance against uh, the persistence of uh, patriarchal knowledge, uh, patriarchal power, um, this work is absolutely essential for a number of reasons, for a number of reasons. One is that um, it gives you a really excellent narrative demo, uh, narrative illustration of how women were viewed in that society, in uh, especially in something that I already mentioned. The way in, I mean, this is the chosen dynasty the variety of what happens in every patriarchal culture where they're trying to keep the women under control, right? 
And the uh, and the way they do it is through binary thinking, right? I mean, telling all women that you're one of two, right? I mean, you're either mm. in the virtuous char- uh, characteristics, and you're uh, you know, or you're in the unvir- uh, you know, la- lack of virtue, um, you know, category. And uh, and um, and what one of the ways they do it is by um, by telling them that you know the 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 things that we we now um, in uh, associate with. Uh, female empowerment is all put in the unvirtuous category. Yes, right? because if you are virtuous, you're supposed to be modest. You're not supposed. You're not. You, you don't put yourself forward. You you constantly have to. You know, have to. Uh, you know, put yourself down and not be ambitious and not have thoughts of your own. Obedience, obedience, obedience. Uh, propriety, you know, propriety, pri- pro- propriety, and so on and so on. Right. Um. And um, and so you end up associating all the ways in which I think for especially for modern women that they see as tools of female empowerment in the unvirtuous category. And for and, and you know and the thing is in historical context that makes perfect sense. And you know I I mentioned a little bit also about like how you know um, you know in the aftermath of uh, you know the the, the really uh, terrors of the 17th century where. You know, I, I, you know, after after the Japanese invasions, we had Manchu invasions and so on, and there were a lot of women who were, you know, who were raped and who was who were kidnapped and you know and and violated. And so and th- there wasn't especially a lot of concern during the second half of the 17th century about womanly virtue, and uh, um, and lots of books written about it and what it is to be a good woman versus a bad woman and so on. So and th- and this this novel comes right out of that kind of mentality. Um, now here, here's here's the problem. I mean, I, I um, you know, I'm sure, I, you know, I, I, um, what one of the uh, interesting characteristics about a country like Korea, which modernized really, really quickly. I mean, really, really quickly, <laughs> right? I mean, yes. I mean, considering, I mean, you know, just considering how fast it industrialized and modernized in a matter of decades. Um, and comparing that to like centuries of pro- uh, process that, it, like, say, England went through, right? And uh, um, and and so what? You, I mean, one of the uh, effects of that kind of you know speedy modernization is, well, I, I, you know, I'm sure you as an expatriate also encountered this constantly. Is this weird commingling of the ultra modern and the ultra traditional? Yes. Right. I mean, it's side by side, you know, intermixed with each other where you go, wow, this is, you know, this is really, really advanced and modern and all that. And then you encounter certain mentality and practices that seem to be not that far from the Joseon dynasty. Right? <laughs> yes, um, I know what you mean. And, uh, um, and, you know, and I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, you know I, and that that's something that like, you know, uh, especially for uh, observers of Korea from the outside perspective, you can see. It in a way that internally Koreans maybe not see it because to them that just that's just the way things are, right? Um, and uh, um, and there's 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 a problem with you know I mean I one one of the issues with it has to do with um, expansion of women's role in society, their their rights and their um, and the and the search for dignity and um, and so on. And uh, um, and you know I as, the, the, the many things that I'm you know that. I as a Korean am very very proud of South Korea, including um, including its you know I mean it's its uh, economic success and uh, democratization in the late eighties and so on. But uh, but with women's rights, I mean I we still have such a long way to go. Yes, uh, such a such a long way to go. And I, I you know I was pleased to read articles um, that I you know recently um, where. Since the outbreak of the Me Too movement in Korea, uh, women are actually saying that the workplace condition have actually improved. You know, I mean, they, you know, and, and that's good. I mean, that's really good. But I mean, but it's not. I mean, it's not all fixed. There's so much so to go, right? Um, and uh, um, and so when you and so when you think about what is the sort of ultra traditional aspects of Korean culture that is at odds with ultra modernity. Which includes, um, you know, abandoning gender discrimination, right? Um, and uh, um, and abandoning, you know, uh, a, a gender prejudice and so on. Um, and um, and I think for people who are interested in this uh, this issues about where all of this comes from, 
I think the story of Queen uh, Queen Inhyun is absolutely important, right? Because this this is like a like a real text that that tells you well, right? Um, so um, so you you've got this very traditional uh, you know uh, binary view of women that Korea inherits from its pre modern period. But the thing is, I mean, what's really interesting is that I I think in the popular adaptation something completely fascinating occurs, right? That um that if you read this novel. There's no doubt as to who's the who's the good guy, or who's the good mm. woman, who's the bad woman, and so on, right? Um, but in modern adaptation, um, in, in in the modern sensibility, Queen Inhyun is so good in a sterile way. I mean, it's hard to have like it's for modern sens- sensibility. You can, it's hard to identify with or even feel attracted to somebody who's portrayed as that perfect. Yes, yes. She's, she's, I mean, I, I'm, you know, she's boring. I mean, that's really boring. Yeah. Oh, Concubine Chang is fascinating. <laughs> I mean, she is fascinating, right? Um, so, uh, so what's what's really interesting is that if you see even fairly early movie versions of, uh, uh you know, of the story, um, it, the Concubine Chang gets most of the camera time. Right. I mean, she I mean, e- even in stories which are not saying that she's a good person. I mean, she is the villain, but she sort of becomes the, you know, the 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 uh, the villain you love to hate. Right. Uh, whereas, I mean, what you know, what what, what more can you say about Queen Inion? Right. I mean, she's she's all good. She's all perfect. Blah, blah, blah. Right. And so on. <laughs> and uh, um, and so people are paying attention. And she uh, and Chang Bin becomes um, I mean, in the Korean uh, imagination, she becomes a much more major character. And it's interesting that um, in a lot of TV shows, she's not the main character. Um, you know, uh, concubine Chang is right, even when she does evil. Um, so, and then what happens is that as um, women's rights and women's uh, role in society does expand, although incrementally. Um, you know, I mean, as I said, you know, uh, you know long, long, long way to go so far. Um, the uh, the concubine Chang um, whole role changes also, and it's almost as if um, for women within this vilified character, there's room for revision to turn her into a figure of resistance. Um, yeah. Because she's she's already accepted as a completely fascinating character, right? And uh, and 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 in that in that uh, you know 2002 version with um, the really famous uh, queen uh, really famous actress Kim Hesu um, playing her and her as the main character of the drama, um, you get this sort of very I mean and also you know I mean what what Kim Hesu pointed out is that the script writer for the show was a woman. And so, you know, so not only with, you know, this major actress, but with a woman bringing her uh, uh, female f- perspective in it, um, you, you, you get this sort of, um, you know, interrogation of this, uh, uh, um, you know, of this old value saying that, you know, basically saying that these binary views of women as like either the queen, uh, in Hyun, you know, totally virtuous type and all the evil Chang Yibin as uh, this ambitious, um, greedy woman um, are not views on women that are in any way appropriate or healthy for a modern society. Yeah. Um, and therefore, this is this uh, this story should become a site of resistance and uh, of uh, of reinterpretation and so on, right? Um, and uh, um, and and I I think that's I mean I mean I think. That's why I chose uh, this work to translate, not just because it's an important, um, you know, important um, uh, Korean novel, important example of popular fiction from that period, um, but also it has a very, very long consequence on our culture that um, that the culture is still struggling with, and uh, um, and and it's interesting to me that the these character, these three characters of King Suk Jung and you know uh, Queen In Hyun and. Uh, Concubine Zhang has become the site with which symbolically and in a literary way that struggle has been, you know, uh, illustrated. And as you mentioned there, you said culture is still struggling with it. I was quickly writing that down. That 
explains, uh, it seems to explain, I'm not sure how you see this, but for me, it, uh, another element in this, you touched on the, on the, on the history and you talk about the, uh, those Japanese invasions and the Manchu invasions. And uh, an important theme in Hong Gildong, which we discussed, was this idea of justice, of, yeah, bad things are happening, but eventually right will succeed and justice will happen. And that seems to be a theme here. Often throughout this text, the uh, writer laments at times and says, ah, what a wicked woman, or, or how can you imagine such a thing? And I'm going to quote a little quote here. There's a point here. It says, when it's difficult even for good people to gain fortune, how can evil people go through, the, through their lives without being subjected to the consequences of their actions? And in modern day Korea, as you mentioned, there, there is still an often a look back at the Japanese colonial period, which is a more recent invasion, of course, and is the, and often a lament of uh, justice must come. And I, I wonder how you see uh, that element of uh, 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 moral rectitude or justice being served out or the inevitability of justice coming. Yeah, um, it's you know it's 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 very confusion, right? Um, yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, the notion that we do live in a moral universe, and uh, um, and you know, and everything becomes well and good if, especially as 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 somebody in positions positions of uh, power, you make policies and uh, you align the power structure in a way. Um, that is in line with the larger moral structure of the universe, right? Um, and then when you don't, um, you know, it uh, nature itself, um, you know, um, seems to criticize you in the form of uh, natural calamities. Uh, you know, I've been thinking about this recently about um, how in confusion views, uh, when there's multiplicity of natural calamities like fires and plagues, and, you know. Mm. Um, that um, that points directly to the uh, the lack of virtue on the part of the rulers. Yes, <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, I you know, as a modern person, I don't believe it, but I think it's a really interesting <laughs> idea, right? Uh, but um, but yes, I mean, I, I I think that you is there, and it's um, and it's 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 a it's a it's a notion that looks backward because in a certain sense, um, there was a. There's, there's always an idea about how in the past, um, in fact, the the uh, the moral universe and the just rule of kings were aligned, and therefore things were well. And then then these disturbances occur when you have um, the reigns of um, uh, you know um, uh, kings who lack virtue, or he's surrounded by you know, um, villainous uh, officials, or you have entrance of figures like, uh, you know, concubine Zhang who messed it up. And, um, and it's almost as if like, you know, uh, nature is self understand. And, and, you know, and that, that's the way I see, for instance, um, the appearance of the dogs. Yes. Who protect Queen Inhyun because that's, um, you know, because like animals are, you know, seen as part of nature and that it's, it's just sort of nature protecting her. Right. And, uh, um, and, and sort of the, you know, the more moral universe, you know, just, po you know, even through the dogs is pointing out that, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, that she's in the right. And, uh, um, and, and, but it's interesting because you're right, because like, it's, um, so you, you got, uh, so you, you got that, you got sort of the aligning of the morality of the universe and the, and the, actions of just um, rulers, um, but then you see what disturbs it, which includes not only um, the intrusions of bad people, like, uh, you know, um, like venal officials or, um, you know, uh, an evil woman like uh, Kong Pian Chang, um, but the use of magic, Ill illegitimate use of magic, <laughs> that creates these disturbances. And um, and also, I mean, I mean, it's also in relation to... Um, you know, I uh, my my take on the 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 women women's angle on this. Um, um, I I you know I I don't I may do this one day, but I I just find I would love to read something about the role of shamans in classic Korean literature, mm. uh, in particular female shamans, and and mo most of the most of the you know uh, shamans the mudang uh, are women. I mean they, they are men. I, they, it's not unheard of, but most of them are women. Um, and uh, um, and the kind of roles that they play in the fiction, 
um, in relationship to uh, what their lives were like and, uh, in, in, in actual history and what kind of role they played in the larger society. Um, it's that's, I mean, I mean, there's, I think there's so much to pack there because like, um, on the one end, uh, whether we're talking about, you know, um, Hong Giltong or, uh, this text or even, even in a young band, uh, you know, written, uh, novel like, uh, Nine Cloud Dream, um, shamans are always almost, I mean, I, I, you know, I can't really think of, um, I mean, there are instances where they did, didn't play a big role, so I can't say this, but they're almost always portrayed as evil women. Um, but what's interesting is that um, when they make predictions, they actually tend to be right. Yes. Right? So um, so the evil shaman in the story of Hong Giltong um, makes all the, you know, I mean, she's, she looks at Hong Giltong and said, one day he's going to, He's gonna, you know, cause great disturbances, and he's gonna be, uh, and he ha he has the appearance of a of a king, and he does become a king. He does create all the disturbances, right, and all that. But you know, they're, they're seen as evil women, and also um, in the in the Korean social system, uh, shamans were put in the lowest class, not even commoner class, but in the class below that, in the same class as slaves, um, because they were seen as a particularly lowly occupation uh you know to do right um but at the same time we now know i mean like like for instance i i you know i, I another another good example of like uh i mean you, you you also may have come across this like of the ultra modern and the ultra traditional mixing in korean culture is that uh <laughs> you know I, I i knew this guy who's um who's whose uncle had like a high-tech company in korea and uh, um, and he he had some really really important business decisions to make, and he didn't know how to, you know, make it. And and he's I mean he studied engineering in like Stanford or something, right? I mean he just went to the top university in Korea, right? But he just didn't know how to. So he consulted <laughs> on Mudang. <right? laughs> like, you know this this U.S. educated engineer who's who's in high tech, right? He's gonna go see a Buddha, go see a shaman, and pay a significant amount of money to consult it, right? Yes. And uh, you know, uh, but but I mean that I mean that's that's kind of funny even now. But the fact that like you know um, these mudang in classic Korean literature are so vilified. And is seen as part of the kind of disturbance that that could cause in the uh, in the moral universe. Um, but at the same time, you know, I lots of people consulted them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, including Yangban. I mean, they, you know, it's, I mean, because the thing is, I mean, Joseon Dynasty did not have a very strong uh, religious tradition because um, Buddhism was suppressed so much by the Confucian tradition. So. So they, um, so whenever they were in positions where they needed some extra, like you know, um, uh, ex, uh, you know, supernatural help, they're the people that would go to, right? Um, and uh, and otherwise, you wouldn't you wouldn't have such you know so many, uh, you know, mudang in Korea, um, and they wouldn't appear as star characters in fiction, <laughs> like they do over and over, right? Um, and so. Um, and and you know and and and, and you know and the anthropologist Laurel Kendall has done some really really fascinating work on um, the lives of uh, Mudang in contemporary Korea. And uh, but you know in in connection with all that, I I just think it's really interesting uh, about the role that they play in this story and in society in general. And I I, I think there's there's a lot lot of uh, research to be done there. Uh, I mean, like once I'll, I'll add this one uh, one more thing that's a little bit related. Um, mm -hmm. So um, in the modern period, um, there was a certain amount of cultural elevation of the mudang because uh, uh, for, uh, I, I, for, I think, really subtly, well, maybe not so subtly, but, you know, certainly nationalistic purposes because um, there's this idea that the mudang are the people who carry on a tradition that goes all the way back to original shamanism of the Korean people before even Buddhism came in, right? So, so Buddhism, uh, Taoism, you know, Confucianism, they're all foreign imports. They, you know, they came in from, from India, from China and all of that, right? Um, and uh, Koreans were originally uh, pantheistic, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 they had pantheistic ideas uh, which uh, were shamans and they represent sort of like the real true 
um, you know, tradition that goes all the way back to the origin of our people. And, uh, okay, you know, as a historian, I'm really skeptical because <laughs> – it's, I mean, how, how do you know that, right? I mean, there's just sparse information about what, and I, I, I mean, to, to establish what shamans do now, all the way back to you know, <laughs> way over a thousand, a thousand of years. That's that's really species. But that argument has been made. So there, there's been, you know, among national modern nationalists, there is the kind of elevate, uh, elevation of shamanism as the genuine Korean religion, uh, you know, not all these foreign religions that they came in. Um, so I, I, I think their view of it was, uh, you know, um, was um, uh, had improved in the modern era. But but you see, like in classic Korean uh, situation, I mean, they um, people consult them, make use of them, but they also vilify them at the same time because they are seen as kind of these creepy people. But um, they're not always regarded in fiction as as outright frauds mm. because as you see in this case they actually are able to kill queen inhyun with their magic right um and also in you know and they're, they're able to predict the future so that it's it they're not frauds they're just dangerous people i mean and in particular to be more specific they're dangerous women because they're, uh, you know, and what makes them dangerous is that they have these powers that cannot be assimilated to the normal power structures and the uh, and the normal view of the moral universe according to Confucianism. That's a fascinating in uh, historical point to look at. Um, as a very last question, I must ask this because it it took me by surprise. So. There's three main characters in the story, the king, uh, Lady Min, who becomes queen, and consort Jang. And in some ways, uh, uh, the crown prince eventually becomes a, a character of sorts. But uh, as we mentioned at the start, this character, Baek Tae Bo, is mentioned at the he's mentioned at the beginning as one of the people who who is castigating the king for uh, re- removing his wife from from the court. And as I said, he's tortured to death and he doesn't break under torture. He stands by what he's saying. And later in the story, some people do break under torture. And you can sort of see that as as an as an analogy to his strong character. But he's not mentioned very much after the beginning. And then yeah. suddenly in the very last sentence of the book, when it's summoned every, every, everything up, it goes like this. It says how fair it was. And then suddenly it says the loyalty of Baked Tebo was without precedent in history set in the standard for all his descendants to follow. And that comes out out of the blue and hits the reader like a brick. You don't know where it's come from. And mm-hmm. I wonder how you see that last sentence. Is this uh, just another really strong indication that this was written by those descendants of Take of Bake Tebo who wanted this to be said about him? Or was there some other reason or some other way we should see this character? And what, did I miss something of his importance, even though he wasn't mentioned so often? Yeah, uh, I mean, to me, first of all, that I mean, what you're pointing out to me is the best evidence that um, the author was working off of multiple sources. Ah, uh-huh. right. Uh, and so, uh, and and one of which was would have been, I think, uh, I think it's, I think it's very, to me very convincing that would have been this internal clan biography of, from the Park family. Um, and uh, um, and now, as for the strange order of it um where you know Park Devil's story is told early then you know there's no mention and then he comes up later uh I don't know what to make of that I mean that that um that may um there could be a couple of reasons for it um one one just may be the fact that um that this is uh this is also the result of um careless editing by later uh people who are Cutting the text, right? So they, they so there may have been something missing there that may, that that would have made uh, sense the uh, the last bit about Park Devil coming in, um, or or it could have been that um, you know that the author himself was just sort of uh, um, I mean they, they did a kind of flimsy job of putting it all together, and then so you get this kind of weird thing that comes you know this this sudden appearance of it uh, coming up, but. I don't know. I mean, the thing is, I mean, I mean, what, God, I mean, one of the problems is that we have so little information about, you know, I mean, we we don't we don't have a single name or sing, uh, you know, or any information about a single 
one of these uh, writers, anonymous writers who engage in writing fiction for pop, uh, for uh, for general consumption. Um, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't seen as something particularly important, so nobody like you know um, you know proudly put their name on it and so on, right? So, uh, so we don't know anything about who they were, what their lives are like, what their literary practices were, and so on, right? So, so the, I think the only thing I can say is that um, you know, so he so this story is very famous, so he decided to write a novel about it. So he gathers material from all over the place and. Um, and some of it may be direct quotations from something like the clan record, a uh, uh, clan biography um, of the Park family. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I'm not able to give you a very good answer as to <laughs> why the sudden reappearance of Park Devoe at the end of the narrative. Um, I mean, they, they, as I said, there might be a perfectly, uh, you know, obvious explanation for it, and just bad editing on the part of uh, people who are trying to reduce the text, or, um, or there, there was some methodology that was involved that we just, uh, we just don't know about, right? I mean, you know, um, I mean, something even like, um, I mean, th- th- I mean, was the, I mean, did the author have some connection with the Pop family and? Mm. You know, I mean, were they his patrons, maybe? And they said that, well, I think, you know, it would be nice if you added one last thing at the end about our great ancestor. <laughs> that I mean, was my like suspicion, that. yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, something like that. I don't know. I mean, there's just no way to know. I mean, it's like, uh, um, and I, you know, I, um, I, I mean, I would love as a to, uh, as a fiction writer to try to imagine what the lives of these uh you know, um, common or fiction writers were like at the time. I think that would be just absolutely fascinating. But uh, it, it would it would have to be fiction because it's just not enough <laughs> information. There. So that's a great place to leave the podcast on. So, Min, so it's always a pleasure to chat. You've been so gracious with your time twice now. So uh, our last podcast was on Hong Gildong, which I'm going to link below. And this one, of course, was on the record of the virtue of Queen In Hyong, Lady Min. And I'm going to link uh, the two websites where you can go and access the articles from, if you like. And they're really interesting and, of course, a lot more detail that we didn't get to in this podcast. Min Su Kang, thanks for coming on the podcast again. Thank you so much for having me. And I really enjoyed this. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. This is just a final reminder that we've made a conscious decision here on the Korean App Podcast not to run advertising. And so the podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast at the PayPal or Patreon links attached below. Or importantly, you can share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And on that, I hope to see you again for the next episode. Thanks again for listening. (music) 